What was your biggest takeaway from today? My biggest takeaway uh, from today was taking the tools, the information that I can take back to our ministry, not just the ministry, but apply it to my life. The way that she delivered her message, you know, how she didn't speak over our head, but she didn't speak under us also, but she met us right in our core where we needed to be met. All the things I have heard from the top to the bottom has been confirmation. Um, chin check me, is gut check me, um, but it's given me all the clarity that I needed for my vision, where I am currently, but how I can plan for the future. So it's been fantastic. So um, Joy had mentioned in closing that we're going to be doing what Faith Meets Strategy, The Crossroads, in November. What would you say to invite someone to come and join and be a part of it in November? Sure. If you're looking for tools, if you're looking for strategies that you haven't been able to merge the two, you hadn't been able to figure out, man, there's something missing. There's a piece, there's a gap that I'm not, that I haven't been able to feel. This is the place where you need to be. This is what just to be in the room with other people talking the same language. If you are in ministry or the marketplace, this is something you do not want to miss, especially if you're number one. Not only do you want to come, but you want to bring your number two. I came all the way from Houston, Texas, not just by myself, but with my team, because I know that what God has put on the inside of me, I cannot do alone. So this is a place that you need to be if you want your faith to meet your strategies. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. Um, as you come in, say, hey, we are getting better on our production back here. Okay, we're excited about this production quality that is increasing. Um, good morning, good morning, good morning. As you come in, let somebody else know that we are here and that we are live. Um, I wanted to share something before we get into it. Um, this morning um, that impacted me yesterday. We've been talking about this quarter being a quarter of victory. We've been talking about all the things um, that God is going to do and that we are going to be um, complicit in doing with God and through God. We talked last week about stewardship and victory through stewardship. We talked about some things, um, but I wanted to share something um, that I saw yesterday on my timeline, um, Bishop Cliff Daniels came on last night really quickly to give a word of encouragement on his timeline. And I want to share a few minutes of it before we get into prayer this morning. If that's okay, drop a yes in the chat. So I know it's okay to share. Um, and as you come in, let us know. Good morning. Good morning, Bridget. Good morning, Barbara. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I see y'all from Houston. I see Houston, Texas is in the room. Um, New Jersey's in the room. I see y'all. I see y'all. I see y'all. Um, and am excited about um, what God is doing. So good morning and morning be good. Good morning, Luana. Good morning, Vanessa. Good morning, Misha. Good morning, Sherelle, right? Remember to tag somebody and let them know that we are live. Each one, reach one. Good morning, um, Miranda. Um, good morning, good morning. So we're going to pray in and we're going to get started. But I want to share, so y'all say yes. I want to share something because I think um, that it is an encouragement that was timely. It was a reminder that was timely. So we're going to pray in. I'm going to share a few moments um, from what he shared last night, and then we're going to get into um, our morning. So God, we thank you this morning. We thank you for your loving kindness. We thank you for your tender mercy. Our Father who is in heaven, God, we ask, oh God, that we are the ones that you would use this week to hollow, to elevate your name, to make your name holy, oh God, in the earth, oh God. Allow your name, oh God, God, to be made holy through us, through our actions, through our deeds, through our desire to walk, oh God, circumspectly and to walk, oh God, upright before you, God, and to be an example to the world, oh God. God, we thank you this morning. God, I thank you, oh God, God, that your word, oh God, is good seed. And I thank you that the good seed of your word is being planted in the good seed of our hearts or the good soil of our hearts this morning, that it might bring forth good fruit. Thank you, oh God, for dealing with the condition of our heart soil, oh God, through your word and through prayer. God, I ask this morning, oh God, that it not be about my intellect, about not be about what I want to say, but it be focused on what it is that your people need to hear. And I thank you in advance for healing, for encouragement, for deliverance, oh God, and for correction, because we understand, oh God, that who you love, you correct. We thank you, oh God, for your correction and your love, God. 
and we count it as done. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Good morning, Monique. Good morning. Thank y'all for tagging folks in. So I'm going to do a share screen. Um, and I want to share that clip um, from yesterday. As you come in, so as you coming in, don't be confused. Um, we're going to share. Come on, North Carolina, be in the room. Um, come on, motivated, miracle moving. Listen, this is my kind of talk on a Monday morning, right? We are a motivated, miracle moving Monday. It's a motivated, miracle moving Monday. I am here Say this, okay? We are going to say these things. I'm excited about what God is doing and what God is doing through this community. If this community has been a blessing to you, drop a one in the chat. Just drop a quick one in the chat. If this community has been a blessing to you in the day, the week, however long you've been here, if this community has been a blessing to you, drop a one in the chat. Um, But I'm going to share this clip really quickly. Um, So let me do a quick little share screen. Let me grab the right screen to share because, you know, the computer be computering. Um, I'm going to share this screen and um, we're going to listen in for a few minutes. Um, I just got off of Zoom with the ministry and I was discussing a text from 1 Samuel chapter 17 that I just thought somebody would want to hear. Somebody may need to hear not the entire dissertation or what I talked about, but just something that jumped out to me. Uh, when I was reading it, that there are certain obstacles that you're going to have to overcome in order to uh, live out your assignment, in order for you to do what God has called you to do. There's nothing, and I see more people coming in, yo, just speak, you know, I'm, I'm not that guy. Just say hello so I know you're in here. That doesn't obligate you to stay, but I just want to know that you're in here. Uh, there are certain obstacles that you're going to have to face um, in order for you to do what God has called you to do. So there's a certain level of discomfort that all of us face in the process of becoming. Um, I believe that it may be easier to do nothing than it is to you for you to do what God has called you to do. And when I say do nothing, I don't mean just totally be inactive. If it's not what God has called you to do, it really amounts to nothing. And it's easier to do that. Uh, there's a certain level of strain and stress that comes with doing. Hey, uh, Peter, man, bless you. There's a certain level of strain and stress that comes with doing the will of God, not just the work of God. Because that's another conversation that you can be doing the work but be out of the will <laughs> because if what you're working on was not assigned to you, then that's not his will for you. So I don't want to talk about doing the work of God. Hey, what's up, Tech? Uh, what's up, Boykin? I want to do the will of God. I want to do what God has designed for me to do. I want to stay in my lane uh, because when I stand before him in judgment, I'm not going to give an account for what he gave Trevor. I'm not going to give an, an account for what he gave Jones. I'm not going to give an account for what he gave Boykin. I'm going to have to give an account for what God gave me. Did I live out my God-given assignment? Did I do what God told me to do? Uh, so I, I, I got to overcome certain obstacles. I got to deal with with certain adversarial uh, moments and and things that present themselves. What's up, court man? Good to see you. Love you, bro. Uh, for me to do what God has accomplished for me, or uh, called for me to do. Uh, and as I was looking at 1 Samuel 17 tonight, something spoke to me very uh, loudly that one of the obstacles, we, we talk about David with Goliath, but before David ever faced Goliath, he had to overcome his family turmoil because his three brothers, uh, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shammah had already been sent to battle. David shows up at the behest of the father. And I said something tonight to the church that I want to share to you. What opens doors of opportunity, what opens doors of favor, 
what open these God moments for you is your ability to obey. And I think one of our problems is the, 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 the conversation surrounding obedience has left the lips of the church. So we talk about being anointed. We talk about being gifted. We talk about being talented. We talk about being called, but we don't talk about being obedient. And what does scripture tell us? If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat of the good of the land. It said disobedience is worse than the sin of witchcraft. So if there's a benefit to obedience, there is a punishment for disobedience. So when we obey, in short, we avail ourselves to the plan of God without God having to put us through a whole lot of strain and struggle for us to do what he's called us to do. But David, and really quickly, because I'm running out of time, David has to deal with family drama. And this is not an isolated case. Because when David shows up, his brother Eliab doesn't have the same energy for Goliath that he has for David. What's up, Robin? Love you. He, Eliab doesn't have the same energy for his brother than he has for the actual problem. He's fearful of Goliath, but he has anger towards his brother. And for some of us who are in certain social media spaces, we're seeing this same kind of scenario play out where it's misdirected ire, where there's fighting amongst brothers and the enemy is not being addressed. <laughs> so he's fearful of Goliath, but he got mad wrath for his brother. But this was not the only time David would have to go through this. Because remember now, when Samuel goes to Jesse's house, Jesse does not even present David before the prophet. David is still in the back of the house while the other brothers are marched in and brought before the man of God. Those are not the only two instances. He has a wife named Michael that while he's bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, Michael is scorning him from the window. That's not the only time he has to deal with this. Goliath is David's cousin. According to the Babylonian Talmud, they are related through Orpah. So David has to fight his cousin all throughout the stages of David's life, a quote-unquote ministry, he has to overcome family drama. He has to overcome family drama. And remember, Goliath is not an only child. Goliath also has other brothers that will have to be faced as well. I came on here tonight to encourage someone who is in the process of becoming, but you're facing the ebbs and flows of family drama. It is not the voices outside that are really being antagonistic. It's the ones that share your DNA. It's the ones that are in your bloodline. It's the ones who put their feet under your dinner table. It's the ones who ride in the car with you. Those are the ones that those are the voices that you're going to have to consistently overcome in order for you to become. But here's my closing statement, maybe among two of them. If God before you, he is more than the world against you. If God be for you, who can be against you? You got to keep showing up. I know it's family drama, and you can't divorce your family. 
You have to be the light to your family. But you can't allow them to get into your head. You can't allow their words to fester in your spirit. You have to keep showing up and remind them like David reminded Michael. I am doing this because the Lord has favored me. And what is favor? Favor is not a car. Favor is not a house. Favor is not a raise on your job. What did David say? By this I know that the Lord has favored me because he has not allowed my enemies to triumph over me. God didn't let your family have the last say. Even though they saw you through the transitions, because remember what Eliab says, and I'm done, I'm over my time. Eliab says to him, I know your heart. So in other words, I know the you that doesn't present in public. I know the you that these people out here don't see because we've grown up in the same house. And while they're giving you all of this information to improve your life and your lifestyle, I'm saying to you, I know you. But what you have to remind them is, God knows me better. And this is the transitional moment that I need in order to divorce myself from the you, from the me I used to be and become the me that I've been created to be. So he says, I know your heart, I know you're evil, blah, 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 blah. Keep showing up. Here's my last word, right? I never read in the text, and I may be wrong. Some of you who are more of a theologue than I am, you may be able to correct me. But I never see in David's life where he receives congratulations from that family. God sends the voices of strangers to be his cheerleaders. Because when he's coming in from battle, it's a group of women saying Saul has slain his thousands and David is ten thousand. We never see where David had any relation to these people. Maybe God had just put them there in that moment to remind David, keep going. I got on here tonight to be the voice of those people to simply tell you, keep going. I know it's been rough. I know it's been tough. I know there's been some tears. There's been some scratches, some scrapes. There's been some things said. There's been some things done. But keep going. Because in the end, everything that God intended for you will come to pass. And there ain't a person alive that can stop it, including you. There's not a person alive that can stop it, including you. So even when the brothers that God has sent you to feed are trying to make you second guess your presence, keep showing up. Even when the family that God raised you up to bless are telling you, asking you why are you here, keep showing up. Even the community that's going to need the skill set that you possess. It's trying to make you second guess your arrival. Keep showing up. That's all I want to share tonight. Listen. I, I pray that bless somebody. I, I wanted to come in. I'm, I know y'all know our normal. We come in, we pray, we come in and do the things. But I really, really, really heard that last night and it blessed me. It encouraged me. We've been talking about victory, but victory requires that we continue to persevere, that we continue to push through. And every so often, God will send us a gentle reminder to not be distracted by what is happening, to not be distracted by the voices, to not 
be distracted by the presences or the absences in our circumstance, but to remember that God has given us this thing to do, that God will not allow our enemies to triumph over us, that God will not leave us without encouragement, With that God, absolutely, I'm going to share the link right now, that God would not allow us to go through and to move through and not give us moments of encouragement and of clarity and of, of, of building up. God is faithful to us and he is kind to us and he is always mindful of us. And I just heard that last night. Um, I was fortunate to be on the original Zoom um, when he was originally ministering, but he came back and shared this point. Um, and I really, really want to encourage somebody. We are praying, we are claiming, we are calling, we are shouting, we are dancing, um, we are saying the things. Sometimes we are affirming, we are we are mentioning, we are referencing all the things, but every now and again, God will send a word to remind us that sometimes it's the stranger. Sometimes it's the person that does not know us. Sometimes it's the person that don't even realize they're being an encouragement. Sometimes he'll let us, some of us are so used to overhearing and we're asking God to give us discernment and to let us hear the voice of our enemy. I've heard people even pray, God, let me see their motives. Let me like, God, you know, we hear even people, I heard what you talked about me. I heard what you said negatively. I'm beginning to pray, God, show me what people are saying that is positive. Show me what people that are saying behind my back that is building me up. Sometimes even when we are asking God for discernment, we're asking about it from the standpoint of showing us the bad, showing us the negative, showing us the contrary, showing us the people who mean us harm, exposing the conversations of people that are saying negative. God exposed to me in this season, the conversations of the people that are speaking well of me, the people that are pushing me, the people that are encouraging me, give my ears access to conversations that will build me up, that will allow me to be strengthened. God, I thank you this morning that will allow me to be affirmed. God, put me around the people. God, thank you for my strangers. Thank you for the people who will say, thank you for the people who don't have to know all my business and the ones, oh God, that are around me, oh God, that I may not even be thinking about, that I have a word of encouragement. Open my ears, incline my heart, take my eyes off who I think it should come from and allow me to be open to receive see. We think about that story. David probably was expecting his father, expecting his brothers. You start to have expectation of who is going to say kind and good things. And when we don't get it from where we expect it, sometimes we are defeated. But I'm thanking God that he is allowing us to get what we need. He's allowing us to hear what we need to hear. He's allowing us to see what it is that we need to see. He's allowing and positioning people in our lives to encourage us and to build us up. I pray that started your week like it started mine. I pray that it encourages you and builds you up. And I'm grateful um, that Bishop Daniels is a part of our community. I'm grateful he's going to be spending two days with us in April, um, teaching us about the foundations of faith, breaking down and giving us revelation and foundational truth. I am encouraged this morning after hearing that word. And I wanted, I, I felt like I could come on here, try to regurgitate it. I know sometimes we'd be like, I heard, try to reteach or try to re-say what somebody else has already eloquently said, but he said it so well yesterday that I wanted to share that here. And for those of you that want to join us April 18th and 19th, he is doing a class called Unapologetically Apologetic, um, which is helping us to really understand the foundations of our faith. But I was even listening as he was intertwining the back to obedience right? Talking to us about victory, talking to us even about how to process our victory. Even when we think about family, I think sometimes even in the body of Christ, we are brothers and sisters. And sometimes we expect our brothers and sisters in Christ to be our advocates and to be our voices and to encourage us. And it takes somebody sometimes totally from outside. I've had my most confident moments built by people that didn't even know me, by somebody I went and spoke to, somebody sliding in my DMs. Many of you started out as strangers and have become my family and give me encouragement and help build me up. So I am grateful. Begin to allow. I pray. We are going to pray today. We are going to pray. But that's the message for today. I got nothing else to add. I don't want to add nothing on top of it. Go back and read Samuel. Go back and read the scripture that he referenced. I believe it was... Um, 
It's either first or second Samuel 17. Go back and look at it. Go back and engage it. But I want you to be encouraged this morning. Sometimes victory comes when we get the encouragement we need to stay in the fight a little bit longer. Sometimes our victory comes to us when we get the strength, the encouragement, the reminder we need to stay in the fight just a little bit longer, to stay in the fight a few moments longer, to keep engaging a little bit further. I will tell y'all a couple of weeks ago, I got really discouraged. I got really discouraged and it was the reminders. It was the you guys in my DMs. It was you guys responding back to me. It was people hitting me up randomly and letting me know or somebody telling me they were blessed by something I said. It was the reach outs and the engagements, all those things that kept me moving through and pushing through and persevering. And so I want you guys guys to remember. It's in the chat. So you got to scroll up to find it. I shared it in the chat. I'll share it again. Um, That God is mindful and he is faithful to us. He is mindful of who we are. He is faithful to us. He builds us up. He's always encouraging us. He's always reminding us that what we need, he sends what we need when we need it. But sometimes our victory is a couple of swings away. Sometimes our victory is a couple of punches down the line. And if the enemy can discourage us and get us, give us to give up, to give us to stop swinging, to get us to be, say, never mind, I'd rather just sit in defeat. If he can get us to be tired, if he can get us to be overwhelmed, if he can get us to be discouraged, if he can get us to even question, why am I doing this? And sometimes our families can be used by the enemy to make us wonder, why am I even doing this? Why am I trying to build legacy wealth? Why am I trying to build generational wealth and nobody even seems to value what I'm building? Why am I sacrificing to show up and people don't even appreciate the sacrifice? Why am I pushing to preach and teach for those in ministry and share the word of God and people don't even seem to be appreciative of the sacrifice? They always grumbling. They always complaining. They always coming for me. But God, we don't know that in our it, as we continue to move forward, there are people caught to us that we will understand as strangers. Much of who Jesus ministered to, when we look through the entire scripture, he was ministering to strangers. The disciples often had to get up and leave and go places where they didn't know the people to minister and to build. When we look at it, Abraham is told to get up and go away from your family. Oftentimes we are frustrated or we are overwhelmed because people, the people that we decided we were going to be a blessing to don't seem to be being blessed. And that is when our obedience has to override our emotions. Our surrender has to override our feelings and our experiences because we have to keep moving forward and doing what God has told us to do. I don't know any, I don't know if anybody on here resonates with a little bit of discouragement. I know you said victory, God, but I don't see it over here. This one's acting funny. That one's acting funny. People that I want to bless, people that I want to be a blessing to don't want to be receptive. Don't see, and it can be discouraging. Your responsibility is to continue you to obey God. Your responsibility is to continue to do what God has called and anointed you to do. And sometimes the indicator of God's anointing or hand on your life is not how many people applaud you. It's that the enemy has not been able to overtake you. That scripture pointed out to me that it's not sometimes the applause and the encouragement and the affirming and the prophetic prophetic word spoken by the people that we're looking to hear from. Sometimes it's just the enemy hasn't overtaken me. Sometimes your, your, your point to the fact that God is with you is just that the enemy can't seem to take you down, that you keep getting back up, that you keep pushing through. There are some of us some days that we getting up and we don't even know why we're getting up. There have been some days where I don't even know how I'm still moving. I don't even know how I'm still functioning. There have been some days where I hit the live and when I ended the live, I don't even know how everything that I said even came out of my mouth because I felt like I started the live on empty. There are some days that I've gotten through the end of the day and I've accomplished so much, but I knew when I got up in the morning, I barely felt like putting my feet on the floor. There are some moments that felt like I couldn't survive it. And when I look back up, I not only had I survived it, but I had incredible 
encourage and bless somebody along the way. Our indicator in this season, don't let your mind be sidetracked. Don't let your thoughts be taken out of alignment. Our, uh, our indicator in this season is that the enemy is not overcoming us. The enemy is not overtaking us. Our assignment or our sign in this season that we are on track and that we're moving in the right direction is not necessarily the noise of the crowd. It's not necessarily the our prayer partners affirming us. It's not necessarily the things that people are saying. It may not even be people being our cheerleaders and our champions, but our indicator of victory in this season is simply that I'm not losing the battle. That the enemy doesn't have, have, have victory over me. That is a sign of God's favor. I may not be their favorite, but I have God's favor. I may not be their favorite person. I may not be the person that they like the best. I may not be the person that they run to or the person that they seek to praise, but I have God's favor resting over my life. And often I'm wondering why we don't get to the place sooner where God's favor is enough. I don't need to be their favorite if I don't have his favor. I don't need to be their choice if I am not his anointed. I don't need to be their, their selection when I'm not his selection. When we look at Saul, Saul was people's choice. He was the one that the people chose, but God has something for somebody else. And if I got to be chosen in this season, if I got to be called in this season, if I have to be somebody's favorite in this season, I'd rather it that I be God's. I'd rather that I be God's chosen. I'd rather that I be his favorite. I'd rather that I be his beloved. I'd rather that I'd be his bride, that I'd be his call, that I'd be his love, than I'd to be seen and to be wanted and desired by anybody else. I'd rather that I'd be his. In this season, his favor has to be enough. In this season, his hand has to be enough. In this season, his keeping has to be enough. Because as long as I am chasing their stuff, I'm always able to be manipulated, shut down, turned on, turned off by what it is that they want. But when I'm operating in the favor and the obedience to God, under the covering of God, under the anointing of God, then I never have to worry if I'm in the right place. I never have to worry about my provision. I never have to worry about my keeping. I never have to worry. Even as we're operating and navigating through this world, earthquakes and things that are going on. When that earthquake hit New York, and not that it was the worst earthquake ever, but in the moment of that earthquake, I didn't have no prophetic insight that the earthquake was coming. I was laying on the table getting my eyelashes done. My eyes were taped up. So there's a rumbling in the room. I can't see nothing going on. The lady doing my lashes got up and left the room. The people are moving around in the hallway. I don't know what's going on. In that moment, I had the peace of God. In that moment, I was like, God, this is in your hands. And we had just said that morning, we can do all of the preventative work that we want to do. But in the end of it all, it is in God's hand. He is our protection. If I'm in his will, if I'm operating according to his way, then it does not matter what happens around me. I know that I'm covered. I know that I'm protected. I know that I'm kept. I know that he is managing me. I know that he is keeping me. I have an assurance, blessed assurance that he is with me and that he is moving through me. If I'm obeying him, even though the customers may not seem like they're running through the door, I know there is an expected end. If I'm saying what he tells me to say, the stream may not get to a million views, but I know that what I am saying is impacting who is supposed to be impacted. If he tells me to, if I go where he tells me to go, there may not be a million people there to meet me when I get there, but I know that the people that he is calling me to encounter are going to be impacted. We have to walk in obedience to God. And we will have to quiet the noise of the people around us. We will have to quiet the noise. We will have to quiet the need for acceptance and validation from the people around us. Let his favor be your validation. Let his blessing be your validation. Let his presence be your validation. When we get up to minister, those of us that minister, I am learning to not allow the noise of the crowd to be my validation. But if I know I'm standing in what he gave me to say, if I'm knowing that I feel his presence, his warmth all over me, that is my validation. When you are operating in the marketplace, 
Let his anointing and his and his presence, his favor, his voice be the thing that validates you into moving into what God has called you to do. Quiet the noise. Turn up the volume on God's voice. We're going to pray this morning. If that's if this helped anybody, baby, this helped me. It helped me. It blessed me. It encouraged me. If it helped anybody else, drop a one in the chat. Let me know. Drop a one in the chat. The favor of God. The favor of God. The favor of God. The favor of God will turn the hearts of men. The favor of God will give you access in rooms. The favor of God will take you where where you are supposed to be. The favor of God will strategically position you in the places where you're supposed to be strategically positioned. But our obedience pulls his favor in. Our submission to his will, our centering of his voice, our making him our primary focus, our, 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 our engagement to do the will of his father, the will of God, the will of our father to be focused on his pleasure, to be focused on pleasing him. If nobody in this earth ever tells you well done, we should be living to hear him say well done, thy good and faithful servant. Well done, enter into this rest, enter into this space. We thank God this morning. I thank, I thank, I thank, I thank God this morning. I am encouraging each of you, do not leave your work undone. Do not allow the voices or the lack of voices, the encouragement or the lack of encouragement of flesh, of people, of human beings, of folks who need God like you need God to be the reason you don't finish your assignment and complete your course. Stay on assignment. Finish your course. Do what it is that God is calling you to do. So we're going to pray this morning. We're going to pray this morning. This is still victory. We are still in a quarter of victory. We are still pushing through the victory. I pray this morning. I thank you, God. We thank you, Jesus. God, we give you glory. Just open in this moment before we jump into asking God and commanding and, and affirming. Just give God a few moments of praise. Thank him. God, we thank you this morning. We center him this morning on the, in the in the, in the space of your heart where he belongs. We center him in your mind where he belongs. God, I know all week long we've been worried about this one and worried about that one. God, all week long we've been trying to make sure. We've been worried about our outfits. We've been worried about making sure the children have what they needed. We've been worried about our spouses. We've worried about getting, making sure that we made the church, that we served effectively, that we did this, that we did that. God, we had a whole laundry list all week long. And many of us have even started this week with a list of to-dos, people that we must respond to things that we must answer, things that we must resolve, think people that we must please and react to and respond to. But God, we carve out time this morning, God, to put you back, put you back, oh God, on the pedestal of our hearts, to put you back on the center of our minds, to put you back on the center of our hearts, God, and to position you where you belong, not as a, just our blesser, not as just somebody to get us through the week, not as just the one that hands us the things that we need, not just a resource provider, not God, we take you out of the context of being our resource place, our pantry, where we go to get the things that we need. But God, we put you back in your right position as the head of our lives, as the head of our lives, as the as our Father, as our God, as our Lord, as our Savior. We reposition you this morning. Many of us, we are carrying you, but we're carrying you in the wrong context. We're carrying you as our resource. We're positioning you only as our blesser. We're positioning you only as a God that does something for us, that gives us, that blesses us, that benefits us. But we have not positioned you all the time completely as the God we serve, as the God we follow, as the God we obey, as our Lord and Savior, as the author and finisher of our faith. We have not always positioned you, God, in your rightful place. And it in and 
moving you out of position. We have used you, oh God, to help us benefit others. We have treated you like where we come to please everybody else. We have not focused all the time on pleasing you. We have not focused all the time on centering you. We have not focused all the time on hollowing your name. We have not focused all the time on helping, oh God, to execute according to your commandment. We have not focused all the time on putting primary your kingdom and your will and your desires for us that we, oh God, are the doers of your bidding. We have not centered you all the time as our leader. We have not centered you all the time as our father and as our Lord. We repent, oh God, and we were sent to you this morning. Many of us, oh God, even in our prayer time have been praying to you to help us please everybody else. We've not talked to you about what pleases you. We have not talked to you about what brings you glory. We have not talked to you, oh God, about what brings you pleasure. We have not spent time in our prayer to offer up worship and sweet smelling savor to you before we came in with asking for what we needed. We have not positioned ourselves, oh God, at your feet. We haven't spent as much time asking you what you wanted as we have telling you what we wanted and what we needed. But this morning, God, we reposition you in a right framework in our hearts and in our minds. We remind ourselves that we are here to serve you. We are here to be your ecclesia. We are here to be your called out and sent ones. We are here to do your bidding. We are here to serve. So all that we do is for your pleasure first. All that we say is for your pleasure first. Our ministries are for your pleasure. Our marketplace assignments are for your pleasure. We serve at your pleasure this morning. Morning, God. God, remind us every conference, every event, every service, every business launch is connected to the assignment that you have given us. So we ask you, God, to help us, oh God, to please you better. Give us the strategy. Give us the insight. Give us the knowledge. Give us the capacity to serve you. And in serving you, others will be served. In lifting you up, in engaging you, others will be blessed. God, we make you primary on our list. We set you as we serve you, we'll be better mothers. As we serve you, better wives. As we serve you, better daughters, better children, better leaders, better CEOs. As we serve you first, as we seek first the kingdom of heaven, all these things being added. As we set our affections on high, we understand that the other things will come to us. If we seek you first, then we know that things will be added to us. Help us to realign our seat, God, this morning. Thank you for your word reminding us. Thank you for your word reminding us to realign our seek this morning. Take away man pleasing. Take away competition and comparison. Break our pride and our egos. We come against even now, God, in the name of Jesus, that spirit of midlife crisis, that spirit that makes us think because we are a certain age, we have to now do things a certain way. That spirit that will not allow us to humble ourselves, that spirit that makes us feel like we're competing against ourselves, we're competing against time, that has us wasting time and resources on endeavors that you have not given us to do. God, I thank you that you are helping us redeem the time. I thank you that we're reminded this morning that our ladder will be greater. I thank you, oh God, that your word says that the end of a thing is better than the beginning. For those of us over 35, over 40, that are moving into a space where the enemy wants us to feel like we are competing against younger generations. We're competing. That wants us to make us feel like we don't have time left, so we got to hurry up and be on a scramble and to be out of alignment. We thank you that you have given us what we need. We thank you that our days are numbered by you. We thank you that our steps are ordered by you. We thank you that if we put our time in your hands, you will get out of it what you have designed to get out of it. We thank you that we are not scrambling. We thank you that we are not panicking. We thank you that we are not in crisis mode. We thank you that while there is an urgency to do your will, we are not desperate. We are not chasing what the world says we should have. We thank you, God, for your patience. We thank you, oh God, for respecting your timing. We thank you, oh God. We thank you, Jesus.
Break it off of us now. Quiet the voice of the enemy in the name of Jesus. We speak deliverance over your people's minds this morning, God, in the name of Jesus. Put us on your track. Put us on your pace. Quiet it. Blind our eyes to the comparative space, God, in the name of Jesus. Allow you to be our benchmark. Allow us to align ourselves to you. Your word says to be holy like you were holy, to walk as you walk. Be our blueprint this morning, Father. We thank you, God. We thank you, God, that we are not in the rat race, but we are running the race that you have set before us. We thank you, oh God, that we are not chasing anything, but that the things, the blessings of God are chasing us down. We thank you, oh God, that we are surrendering our will. And I thank you that even as Joseph spent 13 years between the time that he came into the place and the time that he got to the palace, we thank you, oh God, that just when you were ready, when the kingdom had need of him, when the, his when His gift was ready to be manifested, God, you did a quick work. I thank you for reminding us that you are not constrained by time. You are not constrained by circumstance. You're not constrained by our resources or our lack thereof. You're not constrained by people's opinions of us. You're you're not even constrained by our opinions of ourselves. We thank you this morning. We thank you that we are more than conquerors. We thank you that if you be for us, you are more than the world against us. We thank you this morning, God. We thank you. We thank you, God. We thank you. We give us mindfulness of time, but do not let time become a bondage to our minds, God. We thank you that we are in your timing. We are in your alignment. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for keeping us and preserving us for such a time as this. Thank you for such a time as this. Thank you for those of us that you have earmarked for the time that we are in. Thank you. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. Even looking to Jesus' example, he spent 30 years preparing for three years of ministry and impact. We thank you, God, that we are not bound by time and expectation of anything outside of your will. Cover the minds of your people. Thank you for great success. Thank you for calming our anxiety and our emotions. Thank you, oh God, for allowing us to see our path the way you have it for us. We thank you for it, God. We count it as done in the strong, mighty, and matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. I want to decree over every person on here. I don't care where you are. The enemy sometimes wants to make us feel we got to hurry up and do a bunch of stuff. We got to rush and scramble and it will take us out of the timing of God. God is ordering our steps. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by God. He can redeem our time. He can restore what the canker worm has trying to take away from us. So we look to him who has our redeemer and our redemption. We thank him. We thank him. For those of you that feel like you are starting over, allow God to process you through it. Do not be weary in well-doing. Do not be overwhelmed. Some of you are in the perfect age and the perfect place to operate in what God has called you to do. Nothing is wasted in God. Nothing in God, no experience, no situation, no time is wasted in God. And if you feel like you've been wasting time, don't even beat yourself up on it. Go to God and just say, God, I know you can redeem this time. I know you can move me through what it is that you are moving me through. God is kind to us. I want to encourage somebody who feels like I am past my prime. Somebody's struggling with writing the book. Somebody's struggling with launching the ministry. Somebody's struggling with feeling relevant. Somebody feeling like there's already so many more capable, younger people, people that are more able to do this, that might let your mind compare to what somebody else is doing. I want you to be encouraged that God has need of you in this season. God has need of you in this season. God has need of your experience. He has need of your placement. 
He has need of what you have lived through. You are necessary. For those of you that feel like you older, people need mothering. People need fathering. People need encouragement. Your life is a blueprint for somebody else. What you have survived is the anecdote for what somebody else is trying to live through. What you have navigated already is the encouragement that somebody needs to know that they can continue living. Be encouraged this morning. Many people gave up. Many people stopped living, stopped existing because they felt like they had missed their timing. Think about Ruth and Naomi. If Naomi had given up because of all she lost, she would not have been there to encourage Ruth. Ruth's whole life is shifted because of Naomi did not feel like she had no relevance. Because of Naomi was still willing to give wisdom. Because of Naomi was still clear with understanding that her wisdom and her experience had purpose. Every Ruth needs a Naomi. The world has need of your experience. There are women, for the women on here, there are women navigating hard places of life that they do not think they can recover from. They need to see you. Still talking, still pushing, still still moving through. There are girls dealing with things that we have lived through. You are necessary. You are necessary. Do not write the book. I don't know who that's for. Write the book. Do the lives. Launch the podcast. Start the prayer circle. You are necessary. You are necessary. God is very kind to us. He's very kind to us. He's very kind to us. I'll share this transparently. I had the privilege. um, I've gotten some of my mom's things and I had the privilege to read through some of her things, some of her writing. She was an avid writer. Um, And every so often I would see where she would, in her writing, she was discouraged that she felt like she had wasted time. I don't know who encouraged her in those moments. I don't. What I do know is that she's not the only one that has felt that way. And so my heart this morning is to encourage somebody who may be in their mind, in their heart, in their journal, feeling like they have missed their moment, feeling like they are not useful, feeling like they are not necessary, that you have voice and necessity. God can use anything. He can use us at any stage. Be encouraged this morning. Be encouraged. You are relevant and you are necessary. So I don't know if anybody had a chance to say it to her, but I want to make sure that somebody says it to you. You are relevant and you are necessary. Your words have weight. Your life is impactful. Your testimony is needed. Somebody will overcome because you overcame. Somebody will keep fighting because you kept fighting. Somebody needs to know that they didn't experience that by themselves. Keep going. Keep going pushing. Keep moving. I love y'all. And I believe, I really believe that every single thing, even in my cry moments, everything that God allows me to experience and to see and to hear, it is not for me to be sad about. It's not for me to crawl up in a corner and be depressed. I'm not crying out of sadness, but it's making me mindful. Sometimes we're not mindful of real ministry. Real ministry is not the pulpit. Real ministry is not me talking on these lives every day. Real ministry, the core of ministry, it may show up in pulpits. It may show up on these lives. It may show up in these moments. But real ministry is pointing people back to Christ. We are called to be ministers of reconciliation. We are called to be ministers of reconciliation. We have a ministry to reconcile people back to Christ and to their purpose. 
We are called to acknowledge and to align people. To align, if you don't believe you have any other ministry, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19, therefore, if any man be in Christ, if you are in Christ, you are a new creature. Sometimes we read that scripture and we stop there. We read it. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this person is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, all things become new. We stop there sometimes. We talk about being a new creature, a new creation. But verse 18 says, now all these things are from God who reconciled himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Not counting their wrongdoings against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. You're not new just so that you can shout, dance, and be new. You're not new so you can make yourself feel better. You're not new so you can just be like, I looked at my hands and my hands were new. I looked at my feet and then we are made new. We are reconciled to Christ so that the word of reconciliation can be in our mouths for somebody else. Everything that we go through, everything that we navigate, God is using it to reconcile a world back to him. The Bible says that the creature is awaiting the manifestation of the sons of God for us to walk in our sonship, for us to stand in our sonship, our relationship, our heirship to Christ. So these experiences, good, bad, or indifferent, these moments, good, bad, or indifferent, are birthing in us a ministry of reconciling to bring people back to Christ. So for some of us, how we, our lives, our testimony, what we have endured, what we have been through is the thing that God uses us to desire reconciliation. For some of us, feeling like we lost time and wasted time should prompt us to make sure that we are vigilant to connect people back to Christ. Why? So they don't waste the time. Some of us, the depth of our sin, understanding and being reminded what God brought us out of should have us a desire in our heart to make sure that others are reconciled to him in the same way. There should be a desire and a yearning in us to point people back to Christ. The same reconciliation that he gave us, he's now given us that word of reconciliation to others. So when y'all see me cry, when I reference certain things, it's because I understand this call to say the things that are needed to get people to connect back to God. That is ministry. That is the purpose of all of this. It's to connect people back to God. Your life is a string that will connect somebody to God. Don't hide it. Utilize it for his glory. We're going to wrap here. God is faithful to us. He is kind to us. We're at the hour. I don't want to be on much longer, but God is faithful to us. If you notice, we got our little backdrop, got a little fancier. We got little videos and transitions. I want to thank Omega um, of 7th and Lane. She gave us a new background. She got us some new new little jazzy jazz um, that's happening. So God has been kind um, to us. We got a new new little cover slide I'm going to show y'all. Okay, we outside. We got little covers. We got new little things. Come on, y'all. Okay, we elevating in the world. Um, we have little backdrops and she gave us a background. We got a, I got a different background if I want to switch up and use this one versus the peach one. But I like the peach. We end, we're moving into spring. So God has been faithful to us and he's moving us through. I love you all. If this was a blessing to you today, if you are pushing through, if we're going to follow what Bishop Daniel said and keep going, just write, keep going in the chat, right? Keep going in the chat, right? Keep going in the chat. We are going to keep going and execute. We're going to subdue. We're going to make sure we're going to tackle our Goliaths. We're going to come after our enemy. We're going to do the things that God is calling us to do. God is kind and he is faithful. Good to see you, Akia. God is kind and he is faithful to us. I see you, Stephanie. God is kind. I see you, Cheryl, and he is faithful to us. Hey, Monica. Hey, we're going to keep going. I love you all. I want you to have a dope day on purpose. And remember, 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 count it all joy. I will see y'all tomorrow at 7 a.m. Eastern. We're going to hit the live. I'm going to be aiming to hit the countdown at about 6.57 or so. 
so that y'all can y'all can get the notification and the things can keep moving, keep going. Remember, 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 Bishop Daniels is going to be joining us April 18th and 19th um, on a collaboration with Women Faith Meet Strategy to launch or to put out, to launch Unapologetically Apologetic. He's going to do more with that. But we're going to be launching that. I'm also excited. I'm going to say it out loud. We have a When Faith Meets Strategy room on Clubhouse that we do not use. I um, mean, I've reached out to some of my folks. I um, mean, I've gotten some preliminary yeses. So Bishop Daniels will be coming on weekly to do Unapologetically Apologetic to help us really build our foundations and our faith. Um, Dr. Connie Stewart has agreed to come in and, and do some things with us around faith and staying filled up. I'll be on doing with Faith Me Strategy Wednesdays. Omega has agreed to come on and do um, something around showing up sure around our brand development. Um, Lady Dion Daniels is going to be coming to do a philosophy ladies only room. Um, I'm excited y'all, um, about what it is. So we are going to be, um, we're not competing with nobody else's clubhouse platforms. We're not trying to be on 24 hours a day. Um, I will be supporting other people's rooms and engaging, but I believe really, um, God is really, really, really calling me and I'm leaning in more to the assignment when faith meets strategy really is designed to create a crossroad. We're not ministry only focused. We're not market. We are church. We are here to rebuild the church of God, the ecclesia. And I got some correction about rebuilding the kingdom because we don't actually build the kingdom. Our instruction is to build the church, to build the ecclesia, to build the body of Christ. The scripture says that the gifts that God has given us is for the perfecting of the saints. So we all come into the unity. And I know uh, God showed me something. I'm going to share it before we get off. He showed it to me when you look at... Um, the split um, of Judah. When we look at Israel, when it split, Israel split into the Northern and the Southern kingdoms, right? I'm going to come back and really break this down because um, God has shown it to me and I kind of looked at it loosely, but I didn't really dive in completely into it. When you look at the Northern kingdom, if I'm saying this correctly, was Judah. The, and then there was a the Southern kingdom, right? If you actually look at it um, biblically, it wasn't until the northern and southern kingdoms split that they were conquered. So shortly after the split, each one was conquered separately, but they were never conquered fully when they existed together as one unity. When I began to research and look at the northern and southern kingdoms, the northern kingdom, Judah, seemed to, man, to, to, to be almost in alignment with how we think about ministry or how we think about that piece of when we think about that ministry marketplace conversation. The southern kingdom, um, sorry, the southern kingdom was Judah. The northern kingdom was Israel, right? So the southern kingdom was the tribes of Judah, Benjamin, right? The southern kingdom, that was the worship, right? They were trying to maintain their worship in the face of external pressure. The northern kingdom would have been more like the marketplace. Sorry that I mixed that up. It would have been more in the way we look at the marketplace. They had more, more of the people that were versed in trade and in all those things were kind of in the, in the, in the Northern kingdom, the Southern kingdom was Judah. When we look, when I began to look at it, right. And I'm going to come back and explain it in a way that's more, when I dig more into it, but high level, I began to look at, I believe that there, this ministry marketplace thing that we got going on has a way of being divisive where we start looking at what's better. Oh, I'm in ministry. No, I'm in marketplace. I'm in ministry. I'm in the marketplace. I'm doing my ministry in the marketplace. I don't got time. And we've looked at it almost like I ain't got the church wasn't nice to me. The, t the, the building wasn't nice to me. The people in the building. So I'm going to go over here and do this thing. Then we got some people that's like, mm -mm, the market, I ain't dealing with Babylon. I'm going to go over here and do this thing. But when you look at um, when, when Israel was its strongest, it was before the northern and southern kingdom split. And they were not conquered until they split. I'm going to go back. If I'm wrong, somebody correct me. But that's what I saw originally when I looked at it. I believe that when Faith Meets Strategy, even the crossroad conversation is not about ministry or marketplace. It is a conversation about the kingdom and the church coming together. The scripture says, so they all come into the unity for the perfecting of the saints. And I've, we, we're doing a lot of things sometimes that feel divisive. It's a us versus them. 
but I believe that God is calling us into a place of unity. So everybody has their own assignment. I believe that my assignment is bringing the Northern and Southern kingdoms together, bringing ministry and marketplace together to build and to move forward. So we're going to have conversations that lean in that way. That is what the focus of our room. So we'll be talking about things in our businesses, but we're going to be talking about it through a kingdom lens. We're going to be talking about this and that, but it will be with the goal of bringing things together. It says Ephesians 4 and 12, it says for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, the building up into the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God to a mature man and to a measure of the stature, which belongs to the fullness of God. And as a result, then we'll no longer be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of people, by craftiness in deceitful speak scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head that is Christ from whom the whole body being fitly and held fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper works of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love so there's a jointness and a connectivity that God is looking to build and that is our goal that is the goal when faith meets strategy that is the connectivity we're looking for so I love y'all we're gonna I'll, I'll, I'll research it more we'll talk more about it tomorrow right on that breakdown but I believe that God is calling us to a place of unity I love y'all y'all have a dope day on purpose I know we're over time count it all joy and I'll see y'all tomorrow at 7 a.m see y'all later